Good evening, and welcome to the community listening session on exam schools admissions hosted by the Boston School Committee. I'm Jerry Robinson, chair of the Boston School Committee. Because this is a remote session, I will ask Ms. Parvex to call the roll. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Dr. Coleman? Mr. Deraujo? Present. Ms. Mercer? Mr. Tran? Mr. O'Neill? And Ms. Robinson? Present. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parvex. We are pleased to be offering live simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, Haitian Creole, Cabo Verdiano, Portuguese, Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, Somali, Arabic, and American Sign Language. After I finish inter introducing the interpreters, we will activate the interpretation icon, the globe, at the bottom of your screen. You will click the icon to select your language preference. Would our st Spanish interpreter please introduce yourself and give instructions for Zoom in, in Spanish. Good evening, Ms. Robinson. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Um, Buenas noches, damas y caballeros. Mi nombre es Randolph Domínguez. Voy a hacer su intérprete simultáneo del idioma español el día de hoy. Una vez eh, la señora hayan eh, puesto en funcionamiento el sistema de interpretación, van a ver un globo en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Deben de pulsar allí, seleccionar el idioma español. Si están utilizando un celular en la parte superior derecha, van a encontrar tres puntos. Pulsen allí, seleccionen el idioma español y podrán escuchar esto de manera simultánea. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Would our Cap Capovriano interpreter please introduce yourself and give Zoom instructions. Good evening, my name is Jose. I'm going to be here for the Cape Verdean interpreter. Boa noite. Mi sali pinhoz hoje como Cape Verdean. Sali na sessão de que ele interpreta ali, de que ele reunião de comité ali. E hoje em que ele reunião de boa vindo, para que ele reunião que a gente se acunhou ali. Para nós que está, tem um parte que está falando, um parte de desenho lá mais embaixo, que tem um parte de globo, lá que nós está select. Lá que nós tem contraparte de Cape Verdean, os panhoz que eu ouvi, e que ele sessão ali na criolo. E quem que tem esse lá fone? E por aí vai lá, tem que as três pinguinhos lá, é lá que você escolhe aquela opção, não é que você pode escolher a língua calvardiana, se for boa, se não é que a sessão de reunião ali, como calvardiana. Thank you. Thank you. Would our Portuguese interpreter please introduce yourself and give Zoom instructions in Portuguese? Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. My name is Josiane. I'll be the Portuguese interpreter for this meeting. Boa tarde, todo mundo. Meu nome é Josiane. Você é sua intérprete para esta reunião. Para acessar a interpretação simultânea, você clica no ícone de globo na parte inferior da sua tela e acessa o idioma de português. Se estiver utilizando o celular, clique nos três pontinhos na parte superior e selecione português. Obrigada e boa tarde. Thank you. Thank you. Would our Vietnamese interpreter please introduce yourself and give Zoom instructions. Good evening, everyone. My name is V. I will be your Vietnamese interpreter for tonight's meeting. Xin chào quý vị. Kính chào quý vị. Tôi tên là V. Tôi sẽ là thông dịch viên của quý vị ngày hôm nay. Um, xin quý vị nhìn vào màn hình và tìm quả cầu và bấm vào đó và tìm tiếng Việt để có thể, để có thể nghe được thông dịch viên nói chuyện. Cảm ơn rất nhiều. Thank you. Thank you. Would our Cantonese interpreter please introduce yourself and give Zoom instructions. Thank you, Madam Chair. 大家好,我是Anna,我是你今天的廣東話同步翻譯員。如果你看到那些地球語的時候,就按下去選Chinese,你就會成功進入到廣東話的翻譯頻道。如果你的手機的話,記得按下去選Chinese,就會成功進入到
Would our Haitian Creole interpreter please introduce yourself and give Zoom instructions. Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Sergio Santiller, Haitian Creole interpreter. Nous avons un gros plaisir après midi pour nous interpréter pour vous encore et puis c'est avec un bon temps, contentement nous avons fait ça. Nous demandons pour si vous avez besoin d'entrer dans la conversation, c'est pour cliquer dans le globe en bas de l'écran là, pour être capable d'entrer là-dedans et nous même nous traduit pour vous. Et vous avez nous dans le channel français et c'est un plaisir pour nous faire ça et nous souhaitons une bonne écoute et participer bien. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would a Somali interpreter please introduce yourself and give Zoom instructions? Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Camila Fortun Jamal. Galabonak sam kofol bo mesham kujira magaiwa Fortun Camila kuso dawa da awa shirkena and hadiye li kaftin global ka Somali halka solufta marka isdagi sewa and thank you. Thank you. And would our Arabic interpreter please introduce yourself and give Zoom instructions? Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ahmed Rubai. I will be your Arabic interpreter today. Marhaba, ana ismi Ahmed Rubai, ana muterjim al gharra arabiya li hada al-yom. Bimkanakum al-istima' ila al-terjima bil gharra arabiya min khilal al-dhahab ila asfal al-shasha. Sif shahidun alamat al-kur al-ardiya. Udhwat ala hadi al-alama wa istatadar laka ikhtiarat al-lughat. Qum bikhtiar al-gharra arabiya wa anda astamakan min istima' ila al-terjima kamilatan. Shukran jazeelan. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Our American Sign Language interpreters for this evening are Katie McFarlane and Lucille Trena. Want to thank you all for assisting us this evening. We will now activate the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. Again, I'd like to remind everyone to speak at a slower pace to assist our interpreters. Again, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. This is a listening session for the public to share their best. feedback with us about the exam school task force recommendations that the school committee heard last week. Since that meeting, we have heard from many different people. There have been several questions about the difference in the recommendation and how the invitations will be allocated. So I have asked the superintendent and her team to share the data from the task force simulations using the 20% straight rank citywide, 80% census tract tiers as recommended, and 100% census tract tiers. She and Ms. Hogan will provide a brief presentation before we open it up to public comment. I want to remind my school committee colleagues that this is not a time for us to ask questions, but really a time for us to hear this brief presentation and from the public. Dr. Caselius, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you again for having this additional session and for providing the leadership um, to make sure that we are fully transparent and that we are listening to and hearing from our community. I just want to remind the school committee that the working group or the task force met 24 times. Um, those were public meetings. Those meetings also allowed for public comment. All of those meetings also were uh, posted to our website. Um, they had four listening sessions, public listening sessions, one with students, and then also uh, presented to the equity roundtable prior to them uh, presenting to you all last week. Next slide. I want to just uh, remind the school committee again of the task force charge, which was really to um, issue a group of stakeholders who could uh, really look at the admissions policy for Boston Public Schools exam schools, and then find ways to build upon our um, current process in, um, for application to the exam schools. The reason for this was to address concerns from our parents and students in public around the um, diversity, both um, the racial and social and economic diversity, as well as geographic diversity across the city of Boston. So this is really an endeavor to look at how students access um, our three exam schools. As you know, there were a couple of different uh, 
concerns around the way that we assess students um, and that we actually assess students um, also with grading and how we look at GPA. And then also just that there's a fair opportunity throughout all of Boston uh, in terms of where you live so that you can uh, have a fair chance at achieving um, access to one of the three exam schools. Next slide. So the, the task force met and they came to pretty broad consensus on many of the recommendations um, in terms of who is eligible. And then also um, had some consensus around who is invited. So tonight I am going to share just a quick summary of how you become eligible and just in your, just to review. And the step two was to look at the invitations and how students are invited. And that's really where um, there is some uh, listening that we wanna do to just make sure that we're bringing forward the right recommendation uh, to you as superintendent as we, as we think about the 2080 split and the 100% split. So who's eligible? Broad agreement around the use of both assessment and grades came out of the task force. They decided that there would be um, in the 22-23 year to provide for one more year of mitigating the effects of COVID, that they would not provide an assessment next year, but be full grades only next year. They would also provide a high poverty indicator with 10 or 15 points depending on uh, where you fit. If you were be a student in housing, a student who was with DCF or a student who um, was homeless, then you would receive uh, 15 points. If you attended a school that was high poverty, then that would be an additional 10 points. Um, that, not an additional, excuse me, I don't wanna misspeak. That would be 10 points for those students. They are not additive. Okay, so I just wanna make sure I clarify that point. So the highest points you could have is an additional 10, uh, 15 points. Then in 23, 24 school year and beyond, they will add in the assessment with the assessment counting for 30% and the grades counting for 70% plus the high poverty indicators uh, points, additional points. So let's talk a little bit about who is invited. So there was, there's two options here with taking 20% straight rank citywide or looking at social economic tiers at 80%, um, the other 80%. So it's a 20, 80 split. The other one is straight up 100% straight rank based on your grades and on um, the high poverty indicators that have that come. Next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Monica Hogan, who will discuss with you some of the simulation assumptions um, and uh, some of the methodology behind the recommendations more clearly than my general summary. Thanks, Dr. Caselius. Um, so before we share some of the data from the simulations. Um, just want to cover the assumptions made through the simulation process. The simulations assume a thousand invitations to distribute, where students attending a sixth grade school that has 50% or more economically disadvantaged students receiving an additional 10 points on their composite score. The composite score in the simulations would be made up of the 30% assessment, 70% GPA or grades. The data set we used for the simulation was seventh grade applicant pool for the school year 2021 admission cycle. So that is students who entered seventh grade in the fall of 2020. This group of students took the ISEE in the fall of 2019 for application. Um, so that is the test score that is incorporated 
in the simulation. And the GPA used in the simulation uses fall grades only in ELA and math. Additionally, the simulations do not incorporate school preference. They also do not incorporate any eligibility criteria. So if students had a GPA and a test score, they're considered eligible in this simulation. There are a small number of students who are missing census tract data. And additionally, the economically disadvantaged data by school is from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and is only available for BPS and charter schools. I do also wanna share limitations of these simulations. They can only provide a sense of what may happen with these proposed changes this year, and they should not be interpreted as definitive results. For example, the task force is proposing to include science and social studies grades, which are not included in the simulations. I mentioned these students took the ISEE in the simulation, um, but the current district assessment contract is with NWEA for math growth. The applicants for the next admission cycle may not be distributed across the city in the same way applicants were for this school year 2021 admission cycle. And the grades being proposed to be used have not yet been recorded. Additionally, the simulations do not take into account student preference of which exam school they would prefer to attend. So this slide shows the results of the simulations by both economic status in the top table and by race in the bottom table. The top row of each table displays the number of invitations distributed for each time period. The first column shows actual invitees for school year 2021 which was the last year the ISCE was administered. The purple columns show the school year 21-22 invitees, um, which is under the interim policy, split by both overall, as well as the 20% and 80% portions of invitations. The blue columns show results of the simulation using the first 20% of invitations distributed by straight rank citywide, followed by the remaining 80% of invitations distributed by straight rank within census tract tiers. The orange column shows the simulation results if all invitations were distributed using the census tract tiers and straight rank. And the last column shows the difference in the number of invitations between the two simulations of 20% citywide, 80% census tract tiers, and 100% census tract tiers. And similar to the last slide, um, this slide shows the simulation results by zip code. Um, so you will see the same column headers as before, showing the school year 2021 invitees, school year 21-22 invitees in purple, and then the results of the simulations 20% citywide, 80% tiers in blue, 
and the 100% tears in orange. The last column shows the difference in the number of invitations between the two simulations. And with that, Madam Chair, I will pass it back to you. Um, All righty. Thank you, Ms. Hogan. And, and again, thank you for your tireless work supporting the task force throughout this process. I also want to thank the exam school admission task force for the countless hours that they've devoted to this process. On June 30th, the task force presented its recommendation to the committee, and I recommend everyone to read that presentation, which is posted on the committee's webpage at bostonpublicschools.org backslash school committee. Again, tonight is an opportunity for us to hear from the community before the committee votes on the final exam school's admission policy on July 14th. I know this can be a very emotional issue. I ask that you please keep your comments respectful and use this as an opportunity to learn from one another as we plan a path forward for our students. We will now move on to public comment. Ms. Parvex. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have 63 speakers this evening and each speaker will have two minutes per person. I will remind you when you have 20 seconds left. Those who require interpretation services will receive an additional two minutes. Please state your name, affiliation, and what neighborhood you are from before you begin. When I call your name, please raise your hand virtually in Zoom. Also, make sure you're signed into Zoom with the same name you used to sign up for public comment. That will allow us to identify you when it's your turn to testify. Only speakers who turn on their camera will be allowed to testify. Speakers who do not wish to be on camera can submit their testimony in writing. Once we invite you to move in as a panelist, your window will close as an attendee and reopen as a panelist. Please turn on your camera and unmute yourself. Our first speaker is um, Councillor Arroyo, followed by Emmanuel Bogomolny, Song Zhang, and Hannah O. Oh, please raise your hand. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Are, are we good to begin with comment? Yes, you can start. Thank you. Thank you very much. So my name is Ricardo Royo. I'm a Boston City Councilor. I represent High Park, Mattapan, and Rosendale. I'm also a product of Boston Public Schools, including one of our exam schools, the John D. O'Brien. Uh, I'm here today to testify in favor of 100% tiers as being the system that we use getting in. And I want to give a little bit of the history within this two minute frame for, for how and why I believe in this. Uh, you know, I grew up uh, in Boston. Uh, my father was the Boston School Committee member. He was actually at one point the Boston School Committee president. Uh, and I, my early years, when I was about six or seven years old, I would actually be at these meetings uh, in the old building. Uh, and I would watch these meetings. And as a child, I was able to absorb it. And then I was able to see the impact in the school that I was attending at the time, the Sarah Greenwood, about whether or not we would get certain materials or certain classes and programming. Uh, and so that was an early education for me, but an even earlier education for me was an inequity. Before my father became a school committee member, he was actually the secretary of education for the city of Boston. In that role, we actually had two good salaries at the time. My mom was a BTU teacher. And so I went to the Thatcher Montessori in Milton. When he became a school committee member, as you know, you operate on a stipend. Uh, and to keep that job, he turned down that secretary of education job. And that's when I became a Boston public school student at the age of six or seven. And the amount of inequity between what I was getting and receiving at the Thatcher Montessori and what I was receiving in Boston Public Schools stuck with me for the rest of my life. As a six or seven year old, I was very aware that there was an education system out there. There were resources out there that I no longer received, that I had once received. Uh, and so as we now talk about what that looks like from the 90s to, to now, we've seen that inequity bear out in the process and who gets into our exam schools and who doesn't. It has real socioeconomic impacts and it has real racial impacts. And we just have to be honest about that. Uh, and Excuse I think- me, Please slow down a bit. Thank you. Yes, I, I will. Sorry, that's a habit I have. <laughs> so yeah. thank you. Uh, so uh, we've seen that bear out in the data. And I think part of what I really deeply appreciate, and I want to thank this committee, as well as the task force for their dedication to coming up with a plan that really addresses sort of these inequities that we have deeply rooted. For me, the 100% tier plan 
besides having consensus of that task force, which I think is a difficult thing to achieve amongst anybody, uh, also actually impacts the uh, socioeconomic, racial demographics, all of the different things in the city that show a more fair, balanced, fair process. And what I, I really want to stress to folks as somebody who has a GED, but went to the exam schools myself, there's a number of outside factors that impact people when they're in our school system, whether it's what the environment they live in, what, what stresses and traumas they're dealing with and what they're addressing. The fact of the matter is I was an excellent test taker. That did not always make me an excellent student. We have excellent students who are not excellent test takers. None of that goes to, to actually show their ability to handle the rigor or to make it through these processes. And the reality is the more opportunities we give to those kids, the more they're gonna surprise you with what that does and what they're actually allowed to do when they're put in a position of blossom. Many children in our BPS systems do not have the access to resources that they would then be made available to them in those exam schools. And simply their failure to perform highly on an exam or to perform highly academically in specific, very characterized ways does not in any way implicitly show whether or not they can handle or do well at a school like Boston Latin or Boston Latin Academy or the O'Brien. And so I hope that we come to uh, agreement and, and support uh, fully the idea of the 100 tier program, uh, 100 tier assessment program to get kids into these schools. And I think that's the fairest uh, way to actually go about addressing that charge. So thank you. Uh, I wanted to make sure I lended my support to that. And I thank you all for your time and your efforts on behalf of the city of Boston. Thank you very much. And Thank you. I'm not sure I slowed down, but I tried. <laughs> Next speaker is Emmanuel Bogamone. Um, good afternoon, superintendent and school committee members. My name is Emmanuel Bogamone, and I'm a rising senior at Boston Lana School, as well as a West Roxbury resident. I'm here to talk about the task force's recommendation for the exam school admissions. Earlier this school year, I testified in support of the exam school recommendation that the working group gave. Although I am glad that there has been work going on to bring equity and diversity into the exam schools, it's heartbreaking that so close to the end, it feels as if we're going four steps backwards. The past couple of weeks, it has felt like step after step with the resignation of Dr. Rivera followed by Ms. Oliver Davila ripping away the two Latina representatives on the committee, and then to have the diligent work of the task force undermined by puppeteering politicians. It's shameful and disgusting. The school committee would be doing a massive disservice to the students in the city of Boston by voting for the 80-20 ranking. Not only is the 20% proven to be allocated to the privileged and well-resourced families, but take a moment to think about the impacts that this type of system would have on the students of the exam school. As Isabel Wilkerson says in her novel, Cast, a caste system is an artificial construction, a fixed and embedded ranking of human value that sets the presumed supremacy of one group against the presumed inferiority of other groups. Accepted students at the school will be forced into a structure just like this, with some students getting in through the 20% criteria and some through the 80. This will create tiers and barriers in an already rigorous environment. If we use the 80-20 ranking system, we will be pushing the already disadvantaged but just as qualified students away from the exam schools. We have the opportunity to truly take a large step towards equity. Please don't let the Boston City politics win over the good for the students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Song Zhang. I don't see anyone with that name. If there's anyone with the name Song Zhang, please raise your hand. Otherwise, we will go to Hannah O. Oh. Hannah O, oh, please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Thank you. Hello. Hello, my name is Hannah O. Oh. I live in Dorchester and I am a rising junior at BLS. Every student in Boston has the right to the same chance at getting into an exam school, which the proposed plan does not provide. A problem that students will face as a consequence of the bonus point system is being discouraged from trying as hard as their peers during their, their elementary school years and leading to an unfortunate domino effect. Knowing that they would get an extra 10 to 15 points added to their grade just because of their socioeconomic status, they wouldn't feel the same pressure to need to try as hard as a more privileged student. 
this would actually continue to widen the gap between students of different economic backgrounds as the low income students will eventually fall behind, achieving lower grades than their peers and in the worst case scenario drop out of school altogether. These students may be likely overwhelmed with the change of difficulty in their schoolwork, and some may feel that they were admitted into these schools out of pity through this bonus point system, which completely undermines their hard work and would cause a series of emotional effects on the students, such as imposter syndrome and low self-confidence. There are several solutions to this problem other than the suggested plan that would be more fair to all students. These could include adjustments to the entrance exam to align with curriculums better, having better communication with students from underrepresented groups to combat the severe lack of knowledge about the ISCE in lower income neighborhoods and prioritizing minorities with the exam school initiative, which has been proven to work. In the early 2000s, this initiative targeted black and Latina populations, reversing the downward trend of their enrollment. However, when the initiative abandoned this mission and began a first come first, come, first serve policy, this progress was quickly gone with the number of black students at BLS dropping to a mere 7.5% in 2018, the lowest in decades. In 2021, that percentage is now 7.7%, barely an increase. Bringing the initiative back to its original state will reverse this unfortunate trend. It is clear that the proposed plan could present many obstacles, so I urge you all to reject the plan until further analysis is done by BPS. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Next speaker is Christina Wong, followed by Audrey Martinez Gudapakam, Mike Eichmann, and Travis Marshall. Please raise your hand. Christina Wong. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hello, my name is Christina Wong. I live in Brighton and I'm a rising junior at BLS. I believe that the zip code plan does treat students differently based on their race. Although this plan intended to provide a more diverse student body at the exam schools, it is also giving some students an advantage over the others just because of where they live or their race. A current problem and consequence that is not considered by the proposal is gentrification. Rapid gentrification is already an issue in Boston as more new apartment buildings are built in poor neighborhoods, resulting in less space for local and small businesses. And as rental spaces become more expensive, neighborhoods like Chinatown um, residents are already moving out to other neighborhoods. Many parents see a mission to exam school as their children's first step to success. Some parents even go as far as to stay in the city for their children to be given a chance to learn at these schools. With this change in the admission system, the children of Chinatown and many other neighborhoods have significantly less chances to achieve this exam school's dream, the dream that will guarantee their future success. Parents of these children will feel forced to move their families out of Chinatown, disturbing the cultural values of the place and making the Chinatown community a shell of what it was. One neighborhood will be seen as more valuable than another due to the higher rates of admission with this proposed system. Once other people and office buildings move into Chinatown for cheaper rent, there will be less room for Chinatown culture, overwhelming the remaining residents with a sense of estrangement in their own community. These are only a few of the consequences in just one neighborhood. Imagine if the situation of other neighborhoods were carefully analyzed, there would, be, there would for sure be many issues, just as severe if not more. Communities would be broken apart by the system that divides Boston neighborhoods, possibly even inciting more conflicts between neighborhoods. With the implementation of the zip code system, it can be said without doubt that there will be immense turmoil in Boston. Thus, I urge you to reject the plan until further analysis and revaluation is done by BPS. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Audrey Martinez. Please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Hi, can you hear me? Thank you. Oh. Um, thank you very much. Uh, 
My name is Audrey Martinez Gurapakam, and as a parent of a third grader in BPS, a researcher, former teacher, and also until the end of this past school year, the executive secretary for DLAC, I would like to strongly urge BPS to invest more time and resources in providing high quality ongoing professional development, not just once or twice a year, but every week for our teachers and also our informal STEM education program providers that offer before, after, and summer programming for BPS students. Please stop forcing our children to learn how to take exams, which are not a reliable measure of their intellectual abilities, but are rather an indicator of their extent of immersion in a predominantly mainstream upper middle class upper middle white class culture. Instead, please invest in supporting teachers and out of school providers to be more effective at implementing high quality pedagogical content knowledge in STEM, but also trainings to prevent implicit bias. Each and every student should have access to high quality learning, not just those who attend an exam school. Each child's future should not be determined by the school they attend. This exam school policy is ultimately racist and it separates our children from each other. Our children are not only learning from their teachers, but also from their peers. When we separate them, we deny them the opportunity to learn critical skills they will need to thrive in a global community. Mia Ong's research on women of color pursuing careers in STEM have shown that when a person of color studies in an institution where they are severely underrepresented, this results in them having doubts about their own self-efficacy, feeling high levels of discomfort, isolation, being self-conscious about their racial and or gender differences, being excluded from study groups, and often feeling too intimidated to participate in classroom discussions. The pain of these social experiences in turn are ultimately detri detrimental to their academic performance. Please don't do this to my daughter and so many of her classmates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Mike Eichmann. Please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Heishman to Rochester, Beja. Why is this proposal in front of us today? This proposal is unacceptable. What is acceptable to the school committee and to Dr. Casilius? Last October, Chair Locano made some racist remarks and he resigned. No one disagreed with his decision. Acceptable. Last month, our two Latino school committee remarks made school committee's remarks became public and they resigned. Well, I believe they did nothing wrong. There was very little public opposition to their resignation. Acceptable. The exam school task force met for many months and many members of the public, including myself, testified. On a recent Monday, Monday, they came to an agreement and scheduled a meeting the following day to finalize their decisions. While I personally disagree with some aspects of their agreement, their Monday agreement should be the only proposal that should be on the table today. Godfather intervenes. Godfather made an offer threat that the co-chairs of the task force couldn't refuse. Others probably received similar threats. Godfather's racist agreement, which is in front of us today, would guarantee that 20% of the seats be reserved for the most privileged applicants. Most of them would choose to enter Boston Latin. Very few of them would be our black, brown, and low-income children. The current racist system would be maintained. The day the Godfather's agreement came before the school committee, the city council overwhelmingly approved the school committee's budget and the superintendent's contract was extended. Are uh, these three, three things connected? How else was the public re, uh, betrayed? The Godfathers, I'm almost done. The Godfathers agreement is ratified. White hypocrisy, white corruption, white privilege, and white power have once again triumphed. If Godfathers agreement is acceptable, 
This unelected and unaccountable school committee and their superintendent have no legitimacy. Thank you. Next speaker is Travis Marshall, Lisa Green, Dara Murphy, and Stuart Wang. Please raise your hand. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Travis Marshall. I live in Rosendale. I'm the parent of a fifth and second grader, so I've been paying close attention to the work of the task force as it directly impacts my kids' future. When I say that, I'm talking about what kind of school system BPS will be for my children and their friends in the coming years. As a Boston parent, I have received no shortage of advice about schools, which are good, which aren't, where to go if we don't win the lottery or get an exam school seat, and even whether we should stay in Boston at all. The one constant in this advice is the use of whiteness as a proxy for school quality. In a district where two thirds of schools are intensely segregated, the proportion of white and or privileged kids is often an indicator of a school's resources and opportunities. This is because while white families make up only 15% of BPS, we have an outsized influence on district policy. This inordinate, inordinate influence was evident in the last minute change to the task force recommendations after months of discussion and public input. After compromises on the use of an assessment and dropping a qualified lottery, powerful interests used undue pressure to set aside the first 20% of invitations for our most advantaged students. We know which students gained from this carve out because we saw whom it benefited this past year. Designing policy with equity in mind means putting the needs of our least advantaged students first, not the other way around. I'm grateful to hear Madam Chair's vision of a Boston where every high school has the demand that Latin does, where opportunities and resources are plentiful for all learners. That requires real investment in all of our schools. I don't think that future is possible when we consistently cater to the demands of a powerful minority of, uh, of, that views our schools as a zero sum competition. The less opportunity hoarding we allow, the more demand there is to invest in all our schools. So to that end, I urge you to follow the 100% socioeconomic tier recommendation of the task force. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Lisa Green. Please unmute yourself and turn your camera on. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Okay. My name is Lisa Green. I'm a BLS parent from the North End and I'm here on behalf of the Boston Coalition for Education Equity. After four months of intense study and debate, the Exam School Admissions Task Force agreed to assign 100% of seats by rank in socioeconomic tiers. The data is clear, having 20% of seats set aside from the tiered system only helps the city's most privileged. Despite the clear evidence, on June 30th, under duress from political forces who had yet to identify themselves, the task force was compelled to put forward a plan that would exempt 20% of seats from the proposed new admissions policy. The evidence, simulations run by BPS, last year's admissions data, Chicago's similar admissions plan, all show that 20% set aside would continue to enable the unjust concentration of wealthier white families in the city's most resourced school. It would give more to those who have more and harm those who have less. The Boston Coalition for Education Equity strongly supports and urges the school committee to move forward with the recommendation of the task force that they had originally agreed upon, 100% of seats distributed by rank in socioeconomic tiers. The task force's charge and the school committee's duty is to ensure that the new policy creates an exam school student body that better reflects the racial, socioeconomic, and geographic diversity of the city. That is unquestionably not accomplished by the 20% set aside. 
it is by the task force's original 100% recommendation, which is a significant step towards equity and justice. The sudden forced shift to a set aside for the privilege seeks to continue rather than, to, than disrupt the cycle that's kept this oppressive system entrenched for so long. This is what systemic oppression looks like. Powerful public and private forces colluding behind the scenes to override a democratic process in service of their own racial and class privilege. The school committee has an opportunity to break that cycle by opening the doors of the city's three academically selected schools to a more diverse group of talented students who look like the Boston we are now and who lead us to the Boston we want to be. Members of the school committee, you must make the choice to break this cycle. Keep the 100%. If you're listening and want to tell the school committee to keep the 100% plan, please visit the Boston Coalition for Education Equity website at bossedequity.org, where you can email your elected officials and sign our petition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Tara Murphy. Please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. My name is Dara Murphy. I live in Dorchester. And as you know, I am a member of the Facebook group Equitable and Transparent BPS Admissions and the Boston Parent Coalition. I will be brief. Any Boston resident who has been paying attention to the exam school task force and Boston School Committee for the past year knows that this listening session is an exercise in futility. The intention of the school committee is to rubber stamp whatever the task force recommends. In October, this school committee sent secret text messages to each other and was caught on an open mic during their meeting in which they made clear their anti-Asian bias and their desire to harm neighborhoods like West Roxbury, which they admitted they, quote, hated. Three school committee members, including two chairpersons, have been forced to resign because of their racist comments in direct relation to the exam school policy. Those text messages were hidden from the public and from the federal court, prompting the judge to hold a hearing because of this school committee and superintendent's, quote, potential fraud on the court, end quote. That alone should be enough to put this process on pause. The members of this school committee, the superintendents, and the exam school task force have lost all credibility and whatever trust they had with the public. Because of your anti-Asian bias, your demonstrated contempt for entire neighborhoods of Boston, and the mockery you have made of yourselves and the rule of law in federal court, every member of the school committee and superintendent should not only not be allowed to vote on a new permanent policy for the exam schools until a new mayor has been elected, you should, for the first time, show some respect for the parents, children, and people of Boston and resign. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Stuart Wong. Hello. Can, please, can you, please can you can you, Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm a parent of the students here in Boston, in West Roxbury, to be exact. So today, yeah, I, <clears throat> I'm yeah, uh, strongly against the current recommendation by the task force because the recommendation is absolutely unnecessary. And the task force was charged with coming up with a recommendation that will increase opportunity for the historically underrepresented section of society while maintaining the academic rigor. But the task force has proposed to and divide the into eight tiers based on the census tract. And also the students from all uh, a region would have a proportional opportunity to qualify for an exam school seat that way. And also you add in 10 or 15 points as a pro, you know, poverty bonus to some schools that will completely unfair and also completely untested. Because as you see, previous assumption for this is based on the ISEE test and not based on the MAP assessment. And also, uh, 
yeah, when you adding this 10 or 15 points poverty bonus, the consequence is totally unknown. We all students have the non-high poverty school have to be an entire grade level higher in order to achieve the same equity. Uh, also, what about here yeah, the 49% of the social economic level instead of the assumption they are 50%. So all of these questions are not tested and totally not fair. Uh, what should be the solution? Instead, as Boston is a rich city and has uh, the highest education level, a lot of the people has much better, uh, they are better equipped than the current task force. So they could come out much better solution than the current proposal. Instead, we should increase the more better uh, school, like uh, elementary school to increase the pipeline. And also we could using the budget to build more better school system, equipped better equipment and also better training to the teachers. So that we, yeah, everyone will win instead of now you give extra 10 or 20, 15 points to those other kids. As the previous uh, 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 two young girls mentioned that we, you actually not encourage these students. And uh, in order for the US to be compete technologically with other countries, you cannot just ask other country, okay, we need to add extra 20 points for Olympic competition. Mr. Yeah, cool. So yeah, again, yeah, to summarize, I'm strongly against the current policy and this uh, needs to be completely, need more time, more resource to consider the current recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Sarah Sateris, followed by Sharon Hinton, Domingos da Rosa, and Sunny Pai. Please raise your hand. Please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask the committee members and the public who are listening to make space for the idea that good people can disagree about the best way to admit kids into the exam schools. We can have compassion for other people's points of view, especially when the subject is as important and fraught as our children's education. With regard to the current recommendation, I do think it's a compromise. We heard from members of the task force and the public on lots of ideas from a lottery to keeping the testing grades 50-50 to a tiered approach. Not everyone is completely happy with it and that's okay. That may be a sign that we listened to each other to lots of voices and tried to reach consensus. My main concerns with the current recommendation are these. It seems very complicated for BPS to implement. They'll need to manage eight or more tiers plus the poverty rate at each applicant school plus grades and test scores. It seems like a lot could go wrong in that process. Secondly, almost all BPS schools will qualify as high poverty schools. Some of the ones that don't are right on the edge of 50% poverty rate. Given the BPS assignment system, kids can live on the same street and go to all different schools. So while those children would seem similarly situated, slight differences in their schools mean that one child gets a 10 point advantage over his or her next door neighbor. I can't imagine that's what the group intended. Similarly, kids change schools frequently. If a child was mostly educated in a high poverty school from say K to four, but then switched schools in, K in grade five, he or she would essentially be the type of student this plan is trying to help who would not get the additional bump. And the reverse could be true if parents would send their kids to a high poverty school in sixth grade or fifth grade to attain the advantage. Uh, fourth, adding more reliance on grades, the 70-30 split is surprising to me. There were lengthy discussions about grade inflation and grade deflation, as well as the different grading systems across school types. Further, grade, using grades only this year means again, there's only one data point per, per student resulting in more ties and more randomly generated selection of students. Lastly, adding 10 or 15 points to a student's composite score is a huge change. 15 points makes all B students look like A plus students. 
that seems extreme to me and I would advocate for a smaller bump that gives an assist to disadvantaged students without pretending that a B is an A plus. I also worry that a B student will have a negative experience with a fast paced intense workload at a school like, BP, like BLS. Essentially, I think this plan has too much emphasis on trying to create a specific outcome instead of an overall fair process focused on individual students' ability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Sharon Hinton. Please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Sharon Hinton, a former BPS student, parent of a BPS graduate, and president of Black Teachers Matter and Hyde Park resident. I've watched and listened to the presentations by the exam school task force and Boston School Committee. And while I thank everyone involved in this process, I must admit that the statistical simulations and permutations are dizzying and can be confusing. Since Brown versus Board of Education in 1955, 1974 with Judge Garrity's mandate, 1991 appointed school committee up to now, the Boston public school system has never really been a fair or equitable one for black, disabled, low income, English language learners, students experiencing homelessness or students caught up in the judicial system. Parents and students can't wait until the schools get it together. If you haven't already, I recommend reading Why We Can't Wait by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I think a step forward is the task force recommended consensus prior to the political interference of the 100% tiered option. However, I don't believe that incremental option is the radical movement Bostonians need in order to transform our education into the world-class academic opportunities that our students and families require. This step should only be a temporary solution toward eliminating all exam schools we need to make all schools quality schools instead of pitting parents and neighborhoods against each other again. At this moment in time, when there are so many demands in fixing BPS, let's focus on the students and expanding what BPS offers and not just fix the buildings, although that's very important. If we don't, more parents will continue to leave BPS along with the over 4,000 who have already gone somewhere else and our graduates will be unable to complete globally. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Domingo Sarosa. I don't see Domingo's name. Just a second. Um, so we will go to Sunny Pai. Uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity. <laughs> I want to say thank you to the task force. Six months is a long time, almost six months, to change family plans, to give up seeing your kids' events, to give up missing your kids' bedtime for 25 plus meetings to figure this out. I can't say that I agree with all of the recommendation. I do wish that there was a lottery option because I think as some speakers have talked about their concerns with complexity or the grade levels or things like that, uh, grade subjectivity, a lottery would help with all of that. But that's not the point. The point is, is that whether I agree with all the task force members or not, they were a representative sample of who cares about this issue. And they spent a lot of time and they came up with a solution that they all agreed with. Um, so I hope that you vote for that 100% option. I hope that after we have this conversation that we also can dig into what is going on in our entire system, the psychological impact, the deep psychological impact it can have on students who are not chosen, who are not close to being chosen, and what that does. And what that does to educators who work with these students in the years after this time, after my son is in third grade, just finished third grade, he's about to enter this sorting process. By the time they get to high school and I'm working with them, I didn't say I live in JP, my two kids go to the Curly and I've been working at Charlestown High. I've been in BPS for 22 years. 
high school kids I see, they have deep, deep, deep feelings about whether they're capable students or not. And we send so many hidden messages to them about what we think of them as a system, implicit messages. And that makes our explicit messages of saying you can do it and we believe in you and we want y'all to go to college, feel fake. Two minutes left. That's all I have to say, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Yu Feng Rong, Steve Yang, Yu Feng Shi, and Sherry Kennehart. Please raise your hand. You find wrong, please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Um, hi, good evening. My name is Yu Fang Rong. I'm a parent of BPS schools and I live in West Westbury. I have many questions regarding the new policy and I wish there is a QA session. Today, I would like to ask several of them and I hope to hear your answers. First, can you please tell me what data or which experts said that grade B and better means rigor for Boston exam schools? Pre-pandemic data from BPS show that 97% of accepted students had A plus and A grades. Compared the grades of 2021 and 2020 invited students, I believe there was a huge grade inflation at spring semester of fifth grade and fall semester of sixth grade, even when GPA has only 50% of weight. Because the one year in interim plan was a surprise, teachers did not inflate the grade of the first grade uh, for the fall semester. It will not surprise me if all the coming year's applicants will have a perfect GPA. Second, as for the 10 points for high poverty schools, the will of how helping more low income students is good. 10 points can lift a B plus student to A plus. However, among more than 70 sending schools of BPS, only none of them will not receive the points. Do you think students will apply for these schools in the future? Under this policy, for example, George H. Conley School in Rosalindale, which has uh, 52.6% low-income students will receive the 10 points. But the other school in Mission Hill School in Jamaica Plan, which has 49.6% low-income students will not have the 10 points. So about 47.4% wealthy students in one school will receive the points. Um, uh, uh, in addition, um, it is BPS lottery-based school assignment system assigns students to different schools. Why students should be punished by what BPS do to them? So I have a lot of other questions, but if my time is up, I can stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Steve Yang. Hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? I'm outside. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, let me bring up my uh, script. Um, Please turn on your camera. I, I did? There. Can you see me? Yes. I, I, I turned on the camera. Okay. Um, so, the policy committed by the task force must be approved by either Boston citizen or um, citizen uh, selected representatives. Here's the reason. First of all, the BPS uh, school commission task force does not have a balanced representation. Second of all, the current task force was appointed by the school committee. As three important person, um, uh, a member of the school committee have resigned due to their comment and the behaviors. The opinions of the task force uh, members is very hard to be uh, impartial. Third, changing the exams, schools, admission policy will have a profound 
impact on the city of Boston, a thorough impact analysis needed to be carried out and the results needed to be committed uh, to the public. Families and taxpayers have the right to learn uh, as much as possible about the impact of any such policy before it's approved. So they have enough time to make decision. And also uh, exam school is not a school for everybody. It has a high standard. It's a preparing school for college. We must use objective exam score as primary determinant for the exam score admission. Currently, the company person uses 70 a percent GPA and a 30% exam score doesn't make any sense. In addition, the poverty factor is overwhelming, which deprives the right of other kids to equally receive the public education. The current recommended policy is like you putting the cart before the horse. It's really ridiculous. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next speaker is Yu Feng Shi, Sherry Kelleher, Marie Mercurio, and Carrie, Karen Owens. I don't see I don't see Yu Feng Shi, so we will go to Sherry Kelleher. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Sherry Kelleher. I am a Charlestown resident and a BPS parent. I have a rising sophomore at BLS and a rising seventh grader at the Warren Prescott. I'm also a Chicago public school grad having attended one of the select schools, funny quotes, Lane Tech. I'd like to point out, first of all, the discrepancies between Chicago's exam school policy and Boston's proposed. Chicago uses three factors, an entrance exam, the MAPS exam and grades, all 33%. It also only uses four economic tiers with the 30% set aside for meritocracy. That's not what we're talking about. I've listened to a lot of the exam school task force presentations. And while I appreciate that a lot of time has been dedicated, a lot of people have good intentions. I have also heard statements like data-driven decisions when the data has been so torturously manipulated to give a predetermined outcome. As it stands right now, we have a temporary policy that was in place for the students coming in for next year. We have to administer a temporary policy for next year. I suggest that we stand fast, see what the repercussions of that policy is, and where tweaks need to be made before making any decisions on any permanency by a Boston school committee that was appointed by a mayor long gone and an exam task force that was assembled via a committee that largely no longer stands. Let's see what happens. We know that the exam schools in the past have had 2% attrition, 2%. People knew what they were getting into in terms of homework loads, in terms of commutes, prior to getting there, as opposed to the students that you were dunning in March to try and get the numbers up for the zip codes that were not represented. On top of that, we've heard about gentrification and changes. In Charlestown, they're going to be replacing the bricks, the largest housing project in the city of Boston with a mixed income 3000 unit building, set of buildings. How is that gonna change things? It doesn't change the fact that we still don't, still have a huge number of students Two minutes are Please reconsider this policy. Next speaker is Marie Mercurio. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to mention in my uh, email confirmation for the sign up, it is three minute testimony, not two, just so you know, so you can get every give everyone their uh, full, full 
amount of time of comments because we've all prepared for three. Uh, my name is Marie Mercurio. I live in Jamaica Plain. We have one child rising to ninth grade at BLS and one child who will be applying for exam school this year. I stand in opposition to the task force recommendations as they are untested, unfair, and unnecessarily complicated. And the policy is bad for Jamaica Plain. I'm speaking specifically just to Jamaica Plain right now. The proposed policy is using socioeconomic socio tiers based on census tracts, as well as awarding bonus points to schools based on certain indicators. Both of these features of the policy will negatively impact Jamaica Plain. Most of Jamaica Plain is assigned to tier seven and eight. These two tiers will have the highest number of eligible students as demonstrated by the simulation conducted by the task force. Students in these two tiers will have the lowest chance of admission into exam schools. Jamaica Plain students will also be adversely affected by the task force proposal of giving bonus points to schools where more than 50% of the students are socioeconomically disadvantaged. Using this criterion, there are only 10 BPS schools that will not qualify for these bonus points, and four of them are in Jamaica Plain. That is four out of our five sending schools that will not get bonus points. Mission Hill K-8 has 49.6% 40, economically disadvantaged students, and the Curly has 48 economically disadvantaged students. So close, yet so far. Low-income children in JP will be disadvantaged in comparison to similar low-income children in Roxbury, and students in low-income families in JP will be similarly disadvantaged relative to students in Charlestown. We know that high-income children attend low-income schools, and that is a goal of integration. Yet under this proposal, would this be considered gaming the system? Will high-income families rush to the Hennigan School for sixth grade to get 10 extra bonus points on their final score? Why not? What is the solution? Boston has a larger and more educated population than we had 10 years ago. We have more qualified and willing students now than available seats at exam schools. Excuse me, Ms. Mercurio. Your time is up two minutes because we have more than... 20 people, that is always the, um, this, the, 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 the recommendations. And so would you please give us, your rec give us the rest of your piece in writing? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Karen Owens. Karen Owens. Okay. I think Karen Owens is not accepting uh, to be a panelist, so we will move to Lisa, Lisa Graf. Please, if you are signed up and I call your name, please raise your hand. Lisa Jean Graf. Okay, I will go to the next, uh, Lucia Colombaro. Um, my name is uh, Lucia Colombaro. I'm a Dorchester resident and a member of the Boston Latin School class of 1992. I attended Boston BLS during the only period, the 25 years from 1972 to 1997, in which representations of students of color, specifically Black and Latinx students, was at its highest level in the school's 386 year history, thanks to affirmative action. Last month, Professor Tong highlighted the aim of justice through the task force work around the exam school. Last week, the task force ultimately unanimously agreed to the most just and equitable proposal that could be designed at this moment. You're on mute. Change. 
this systemic change would create the conditions for robust and healthy human development for every child in the BPS system. The proposal reduces systemic racism greater than any other proposal put forth in the history of the city of Boston. It is historic for the level of knowledge, understanding, and transformative capacity it embodies, all pointing toward the fulfillment of the promise of every child and young person in Boston to be an active and vibrant citizen of our society and our nation, contributing their gifts and talents free from harm. Systemic racism, in other words, white privilege. In the task force original proposal, it noted that white students make up only 16% of the school age population of the city of Boston, while the expectation of seats allocated to white students after its implementation was 32% of the seats, twice as many. This is white privilege at the systemic level. Why didn't the white led and doubly speak name equitable and transparent exam school group complain about this? Instead, they co-opted the idea of discrimination against Asian families and maligned the predominantly woman of color led BPS system to distract from the glaring advantage the task force already afforded white students. The shameless and unfathomable behind the scenes messaging of threat that took place last week to override the work of the task force is white supremacy. If the rules of white privilege no longer work for white supremacy, they simply get to change. Not today, Excuse not me. in Boston, not for Please our children. Please slow down. Please slow down. Thank you. Sorry, uh, I have one more paragraph. Okay. Uh, Boston Latin School is my alma mater. Mr. Contempasis, you've known me since I was 13 years old. In my younger years, I stood by your side representing to alumni the promise of BLS to give working class kids a chance at a better life. Please put your legacy on the right side of history. Your leadership now should be as an educator working for the power of education to open the mind and uplift the spirit, spirit to meet questions of truth and justice equipped with the skills for critical thinking and moral capacity. Upholding the mechanisms of white privilege require us to cease questioning, cease dissenting, cease thinking, to allow it to endure. Allowing this assertion of white privilege to stand is fundamentally an act of ignorance. Fulfill the promise of Boston Latin School and Boston Public Schools correctly. We are one system, one city. Make this change, keep it 100%. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will try with Lisa again. Lisa Jean Graff. Now, for some reason, it's not working. So I will continue with Dan French. Dan French, Jess Madden Fuoco. Aminata Kaba and Alicia Wedderborn. Oh, Lisa is here. Yes. Lisa, please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Hello. Um, okay. I'm Lisa. Hello. Um, I'm Lisa Graf. Um, and I wanted to read um, my ideal is for the selective admission schools to have an open lottery process and for all schools to be well-resourced. That being said, I support the proposal by the exam school admissions task force that does not have a 20% set aside. Please support the task force's original 100% recommendation. This is a large improvement in access for many underrepresented groups. With this proposal, the selective admission schools will better reflect and increase access to the full diversity of the district. This includes students with disabilities, English language learners, as well as increasing racial and economic diversity. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Dan French. My name is Dan French. As a JP resident, parent of BPS grad, member of Boston Coalition for Education Equity and board president of Citizens for Public Schools, I urge the school committee to approve the exam school task force's recommendation from a week ago, Monday night. In a straw poll, a supermajority recommended assigning 100% of seats through rank and socioeconomic tiers. 
Historically, the exam school's admissions process ensured that white well-to-do students whose families had means to hire tutors had the advantage in gaining a seat over Black, Latinx, and English learners. As a result, during this past year, 72% of district-wide students were Black or Latinx, while only 21% of PLS students were Black or Latinx. White and Asian students were overrepresented at 45% and 29%. BLA enrolled white and Asian students at double the percent of their district enrollment. The percent of ELs in the three exam schools ranged from 0 to 1% and 3 to 4% for students with disabilities. Structuring the admissions process to benefit white privileged families continued in part for this coming year with 20% set aside. Exam schools are a systemic racist component of the district. Along with underrepresentation of Black and Latinx students in the AWC, their overrepresentation in substantially separate special education programs, and disproportionately high suspension of Black and Latinx students, even when committing the same offense as white students, Black and Latinx students are denied equitable, high quality learning time opportunities. It is past time for the committee to transform all district systems which generate disparate outcomes by race, starting with the exam schools. We appreciate the exam school task force's data-driven research-based work and reject interference by city council members. Clandestinely intervening at the 11th hour amplified white privilege, undercut democratic principles, and undermine trust between the school committee and community. The school committee should reinstate and vote on assigning 100% of exam school seats through rank and socioeconomic tiers and approve all supports that accompany the task force's assignment recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Jess Madden Foco. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Jess Madden Fuoco. I'm a BPS parent of two children at the Hernandez School and a resident of Hyde Park. I don't actually believe that tests should be used to make high stakes decisions about children because I don't think they give us good information about children's learning or potential. But we have schools that have used exams since 1963. And the exam school task force worked for many hours to come up with a policy that would create a more equitable admissions process and would work toward creating a student body that is more representative of the overall student demographics of the Boston Public Schools. The 20% set aside that was forced upon the task force by city councilors would privilege white families and would privilege economically privileged families. This was not the charge of the task force. And this is not your role as a school committee member. The charge of the task force was to come up with a policy that would be more equitable based on race, geography, and socioeconomic status. The 20% set aside runs counter to this charge. So you should return to the proposal and allocate 100% of seats based on socioeconomic tiers. I am also a BPS employee, and I've always been proud to be a BPS employee. I've been part of many working groups and our group's ideas have always been respected. The secret intervention by city councilors sets a dangerous and disturbing precedent that a task force can work for months and then have their work tampered with. I want to urge you to respect the proposal that the exam school task force had consensus around and allocate 100% of seats by tiers. You will hear from other white parents who urge you to continue to privilege their own children and use only exams and grades, which they have been gaming for years to their own advantage. You will hear them say racist things like they are worried about how children of color will do at exam schools if they get in under a new admissions policy. This should show you that these white families do not know our students of color. My students at English High are as brilliant as the students at exam schools, and it's despicable to insinuate that they are not as worthy of a seat at an exam school. As a system, we have to stop pandering to and bending to the demands of white and privileged parents when they are advocating only in their self-interest and whose children make up less than 15% of the school district's population. 
as BPS employees and as school committee members. This is not our charge. Our charge is to support what is best for all children in our district. And in this case, it's clear that if BPS won't consider a pure lottery, then 100% of seats should be allocated by SES tiers. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Aminata Kaba. I don't see anyone with that name. Um, so we will go to Alicia Weatherburn, followed by Elena White, Andrew Berg, and Anna Ross. Alicia? Please turn on your camera and unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I am um, a Boston resident. I'm also a Boston public schools educator, as well as a parent to three Boston public school students, one of which is a rising ninth grader at Boston Latin School. Um, I am I'm here today to urge that um, the task force keep it 100 and take your power back and go with the initial proposal that you all agreed upon and wanted to put forward. I think that um, this current 20% set aside uh, proposal, um, one is not what you wanted to do. Um, and without the interference of uh, politicians who want to undermine this process, uh, I think that we, you would be voting on that 100%. So I would like for you to, again, um, take your power back and, and, and do what you as a task force um, had initially decided on doing. Um, I also um, would like to say that as a uh, Boston Latin School alum myself. I actually, like uh, Lucia, uh, went to Boston Latin School during that time when there were the most um, percentage of students of color in all of the um, Boston Latin School's history. Um, there was also a lot more teachers of color at Boston Latin School. Um, when I went there, there was close to a quarter of Black students who were um, at Boston Latin School. My son, who's currently in Boston Latin School, um, his class makes up about, what, about 7% of Black students. He's often in classes where he's the only Black oh student God. in the class. He um, has really had a hard time with that because he doesn't feel the support um, and it's really telling that 30 years, more than 30 years later, that there's so far fewer Black students at Boston Latin School and that there are people who want to keep it that way. Um, and, and that's also telling. I understand privilege. Um, I understand wanting to keep it. Um, but your task was to increase um, the number of Black and um, Latin students. And so you should go with your initial recommendation in order to do that. I know that as a student, as a teacher, um, meritocracy is a myth. I went to Boston Latin School. I went to many of the schools in Boston that are considered um, top tier schools. Meritocracy is a myth. Excuse Thank me, Ms. Weldon, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Elena White. Good evening. Um, my name is Elena White. I live in Jamaica Plain. I'm a parent of two students who attend the Curly K to eight, one a first grader, a rising first grader, rising fourth grader. I'm testifying this evening 100% um, in support of the original task force plan to distribute 100% of seats by rank within socioeconomic status tiers. Um, we live in a very unjust world, one that prioritizes white wealthy individuals at all levels of our society. 
I support this plan in part because it can't be as easily gamed with wealth and privilege and abundant resources. The data presented unequivocally show that, 20, that the 20% citywide set aside would give extra seats to the most privileged families. And as a white upper middle class parent, I'm here to say that my children do not need nor do they deserve additional unearned benefits. They already inherited a huge amount of unearned privilege in their lives. And I want my children to be part of an educational system that is grounded in equity that will grant fair access to exam schools, something that has been denied um, for, for generations to Black and Latinx and, and other, other groups. The 100% plan in my mind is already a compromise. Many of us favored a lottery of qualified applicants rather than going in rank order, which amplifies the impact that wealth can have on the process because after all, hiring a private tutor or enrolling in an expensive test prep course can move one's test score and percentage points up in rank. I'm also deeply disheartened and, dis and disturbed by the shady backroom dealing that's been happening over the last couple of weeks. Our children are watching and listening to this process and I appreciate the students who've taken the time out this evening to testify. I, I wanna ask um, the, the task force and the, and the committee, is this really the lesson we wanna teach our youth that a public process that centers community voice and data and research that's grounded in a sincere effort to, to make an educational system more equitable can be upended or blockaded by a few moneyed powerful individuals who have their own best interests in mind. I urge you not to be swayed by these, these shady individuals who are only working to ensure that those with privilege remain privileged. We want equitable access to exam schools, keep it 100%. Our public systems need to work to undo structural racism at the core of our country and all of its systems, including within education. This is one small step that Boston can take today. There are many more steps that need to be taken. I hope we can soon turn our attention to the 100 other schools in the district um, that need to be offering a high quality education to all of our students. Thank you to the task force members for all your hard work, your resolve, and your courage. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Andrew Berg. Hello, sorry, <laughs> Wait, there are two of us in this room. Um, I am a BPS parent and also a BPS teacher. I have a ninth grader at Boston Latin School and a rising sixth grader. Um, and I am just, I'm going to be brief, I just want to encourage the committee to support the original 100% social economic tiers system. This is, I think the question we have to ask is, are we a democracy or not? You know, do we get to have a public process where all of these details are talked about and negotiated and different people re voice their opinions and then somebody comes in and says, oh, well, we better do it that way because something bad is going to happen otherwise. That is just absolutely not okay. That is not the message I want my children to get or anybody else's children to get. Um, and that's all I have to say. Keep it on, please. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Anna Ross, followed by Krista Magnusson, Kimberly Harris, and Yu Hong Jia. Anna Ross. We can't hear you. Yes. No, we can speak. I, you're not on mute, but we can't hear you. Maybe we, no, we can't hear you. Maybe we could try again. Okay, so you're trying again. Okay, so I'm, we're going to go to the next speaker. 
and uh, I will call you again. So next speaker is Krista Magnusson. Hi, am I good? Yes. Great. Good evening. Uh, my name is Krista Magnuson. I am a BPS parent of a rising sixth grader and a fourth grader, a member of the Boston Coalition for Education Equity and a co-chair of JP Progressives, and I'm a resident of Jamaica Plain. Um, to the other residents of Jamaica Plain, I would quickly like to add the data shown to us earlier tonight in this hearing says that Jamaica Plain will see a difference of exactly one seat between the 80% and the 100% plans. So that's just something I noted while we were uh, having that presentation earlier. Um, I want to add my voice to those speaking tonight in support of the task force's original 100% recommendation. The proposal is perfectly clear and easy to understand. Adding a 20% set aside is not only unnecessarily complicated, but it does nothing except ensure that more privilege is reserved for the already privileged. And I count my family among that number. Um, I have been asked how I could possibly support a proposal that would make it less likely for my rising sixth grader to get a seat at an exam school. All I can say to that is how could I possibly support a system that means my child's advantages of birth would place him above another student who was simply unlucky enough not to be born with the same advantages. The literal least we can do is to try and level the playing field such that students, if they must compete, compete with others from roughly the same socioeconomic background. Uh, additionally, how could I explain to my children that I was okay with elected officials swooping in at the last minute to subvert a public democratic process that played out over several months and you know, held the school budget hostage in order to protect privileges for those who least need that help? what would I be teaching them? As several people have noted, the 100% recommendation is already a compromise. Um, and it's the best we're going to do until we're ready to make truly radical changes that turn the system into something other than a Hunger Games zero sum situation that forces our children to compete for resources. So uh, since we apparently aren't ready to go bigger and bolder, let's at least not settle for anything less than keeping it 100. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Kimberly Harris. I don't see anyone with that name, Kimberly Harris. So we will go to Yu Hong Jia. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. My name is Yu Hong Jia and I live in West Roxbury. I'm the parent of two BPS students as well as a teacher working in a private school. I'm here today to speak against the proposed exam school admission recommendations. I believe that the recommendations are too complicated and will not achieve the equity and the diversity that the task force members planned. First of all, we all know that some low-income children in Boston go to non-high poverty schools due to busing from their low-income neighborhoods, and they will not receive a 10-point poverty bonus that they deserve. And vice versa, higher income children who go to high poverty schools will receive a 10-point poverty bonus. If BPS uses the proposed recommendations, I think that it will result with the higher income children in the lower income schools getting the benefits. This is not equitable at all for the real economically disadvantaged children who we need to help. Secondly, undocumented immigrants are not eligible for the BHA housing and even recent arrivals to the United States will be at a disadvantage because of the long waiting list for BHA housing these people were more negatively impacted by the pandemic, but their children will not receive a 15-point poverty bonus. This is unfair. Therefore, I think that the proposed admission policy does not include all of the BPS students who were impacted by the pandemic. 
I believe that the BTS should use each student's individual social and economic data, not the tiered schools. To the school committee members, your decision will have a profound impact on BTS as well as Boston at large. The questions I have for you are whether the proposed admission policy is fair and equitable for all of our BTS students, especially the economically disadvantaged students. Another question is whether academic standard at the exam schools can be maintained with a new admission policy, not only in the short term, but in the long run. I hope the school committee will reconsider the policy. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I will try with Anna Ross again. Please unmute yourself. Hello, is this better now? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Sorry about that. I had interference. Um, thank you so much for giving us the time to respond to this um, proposal uh, before you. Um, I uh, am a parent of a BLS student, a rising ninth grader, um, and uh, another BPS student who is a rising sixth grader. Um, and I do have uh, one objection to this proposal, and that is that um, it doesn't take into account students with disabilities who legally are required to be educated in the least restrictive environment possible, um, but they're systematically excluded from uh, admission to exam schools by these policies and often are uh, not supported fully if they do gain entrance to exam schools. And I would urge the committee to take that into account when making these decisions. Um, my husband and I live in Dorchester and we're raising our kids and sending them to, the, sending them to school um, through the Dorchester Public Schools. They attended uh, the Mather um, first from K-1 through third grade and then the Lee K-8 from fourth through sixth grade. Um, the Mather has a 66.3% poverty rate. That was the latest figure I could find. The Lee a 76.6 poverty rate. I thought I should um, include that information as others have been uh, including their pov school poverty rates. Um, my husband and I decided to send our kids um, we're obviously white and we are middle class. We decided to send our kids to school in BPS in Dorchester um, because we weren't trying to game the system as some people have thought that maybe white parent, middle class parents might do. But we believed that um, educating our kids in the most racially and economically diverse group of peers as possible was the only way or one of the best ways to undermine all of the racist assumptions and messaging that they would receive um, as members of this society. And that was very successful. And I just want to um, point out that when my daughter, who's now a ninth grader, came to BLS, she had already learned alongside kids who were um, homeless, kids for whom English was not their first language. Um, the majority of the students in her classrooms came from vastly different backgrounds than she. And, um, and she believed them to be her peers because she knew they were. She, they demonstrated their intelligence and their aptitude every day next to her in her classroom. So when she arrived at BLS, she was shocked to turn around and see so few of them with her. Um, it was really upsetting to her so much so that she didn't want to admit that she went to BLS for the first year that she was there, she would say she went to BPS because she felt that she had somehow taken advantage of a system. So I think I wanna make the point that our students are watching, our children are watching as we allow this sort of backstage politicking to go on. They see what's happening and they see who their peers are and they get those messages, whether we want to give them to them or not. And I'll just end by saying that I find it incredibly offensive as somebody whose children have gone to school with these wonderful students, that people would say that allowing children from Dorchester into BLS um, would somehow weaken uh, the, the um, rigor of the school. It's simply not true. And to, to make those, cast those aspersions on these ch children really shows, um, it shows what we think as a society. And, um, and I wanted, I'd wanna stand up and say it's not true. They belong there.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is CJ Conan, Rachel Meiselman, Zina Lam, and Ginny Gad. CJ Conan, I don't see anyone with that name. So I will go to Rachel Meiselman. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. My name is Rachel Meiselman, and I am a proud alumna of the Robert Gould Shaw Middle School and Boston Latin School. On June 30th, the exam school's admissions task force presented a new exam admission policy. I would say that lipstick has been applied to a pig, but it remains a pig. This new policy calls for Boston to be divided into eight socioeconomic status tiers. In addition, the task force is using an economically disadvantaged indicator to show what are termed high poverty schools. Poverty points 10 to 15 will be added to composite scores of students in BPS schools with a greater than 50% economically disadvantaged indicator. This is a confusing plan, but again, this stands as another naked attempt to carry out social engineering to benefit some over others. Indeed, the aforementioned poverty points will give an unfair advantage to some BPS students over their peers in charter schools and Catholic schools, as well as their friends in MECPO, which is both unfair and illegal. I've heard a lot about, I've heard a lot of discussion about systemic racism. I've not heard, however, anything about systemic failure. Systemic failure to address the issues that plague the feeder schools and the failure to create a constellation of strong secondary schools that offer environments where all of our children may thrive. I've not heard anything about the support for children that may need it in a famously tough academic environment for any student. Now, there have been calls to remove politics from the process. I agree, but I would say both plans that have been put forth by the exam schools task force and the very creation of the task force have been born out of politics. This is about the education of our children. Two minutes this is not about privilege, but hard work and the fruits that that yields. Because of the work of the task force, neighborhoods are now being pitted one against the other. And sadly, race relations have, yes, been set back to decades. The racial animus toward Asians and whites is in fact palpable. As a mixed race woman that is not speaking as someone who has been oppressed, I hope that I've been heard by the many people that have been speaking out for black and brown people. And remember, I remain ready to die on three hills. The improvement of the feeder schools, the creation of a galaxy of secondary schools where all of our children may thrive and be in an environment that is comfortable for them. And of course, the defense of Mr. C, who oppressed upon me so many, many years ago as a 13 year old, and then as a 14, 15, 16, 17 year old, that I, along with all my peers, could be anything that I wanted to be through hard work and grit. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Zina Lam. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can't see your um, all there. Thank you. <laughs> yep. My name is Zen Alam, and I'm a South End resident and parent to a BPS student since K2, who is now at BLA. For full disclosure, I'm a former BPS employee and most recently served on both the working group and task force. I do feel the need to clarify the superintendent's introductory remarks when the co-chair is presented to the school committee on June 30th. Specifically, at approximately the three hour mark, she attributes the recommendation as one that the committee chose to present, quote unquote. Let's be clear, as I interpreted the proceedings of our meeting on the 29th, there was no choice. There was also no vote. 
In effect, this was not a recommendation of the task forces, but of those still unnamed officials who applied pressure offline, in the shadows, ostensibly holding budgets in our students and schools hostage. I don't presume to speak for my peers. I speak only for myself as I don't wish to be associated with an action that I deem to be a takeover of my voice. In my opinion, characterizing the policy as a task force recommendation is a misnomer. It wrongfully places accountability for the recommendation on the task force. This is disinformation at its insidious best. It is akin to certain elected officials calling the January 6th DC insurrection is no more harmful than a tourist visit. While what transpired on the 29th and 30th wasn't as blatant or violent, I would posit that what did occur was worse because of its subtlety and its that's the way it goes acceptance. As such, it is easy to put aside, thus allowing the practice of political intimidation, systemic oppression and protection of privileged power to continue, maintaining what I guess is considered an acceptable level of inequity. From my perspective, at best the task force informed the policy, which should not be conflated with a wholesale recommendation. This would continue to deny my voice and possibly those of others who dedicated months and hours toward an end that was not fully represented. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Ginny Gass. I don't see that name. If you're here, please raise your hand. Otherwise, we will have Wenmig Gi, Rachel Polliner, Thomas Hayes, and Ling Sheng Dong. When Ming, when Ming Gi. Can you hear me? Can yes. you see me? Yes, thank you. Okay, hi. Uh, hi, this is Wen Ming, and uh, I am a uh, uh, parent of uh, BPF's student, and. Uh, here I hear a lot of uh, come uh, yeah, yeah. and uh, I will strongly uh, recommend to uh, object reject the task force plan because I think it's unfair to the students to who will be eligible for the uh, exam school and uh, I feel if some students receive 10, 15 points. Uh, for the uh, admission, then how about uh, when they uh, move to next grade and move to next college, where they keep receiving those 15 or 10 points? And if one question is very, uh, uh, come to me is that if this committee, if the city of Boston realize that those students are unprivileged or social or economically, did they take any, uh, uh, measures or actions to improve, give them chance to improve their uh, academic, for example, um, uh, ability or improve them, the study. And as one parent says, he, she is so confident. There are so many good students find uh, economic, ac academically, then why don't let the, key, the kids, let the students to take a test, let the test result and tell themselves, tell the whole world that they are, for example, they are equally for not talented. And I, I just feel surprised that there are so many students, uh, if, for, if they, uh, for, uh, they, they, they disqualified by this zip code, by this then how we can tell them and then uh, fairly and can tell them this is they disqualified that they did not get a chance because of the zip code. So I strongly, for example, uh, ask to reject this, this plan. And if, for example, some race physical disadvantage should they add some points to qualify the US Olympic team if, for example, as an Asia, if I finish a 100 meter race, for example, 30 seconds, should I count as 12 seconds or 10 seconds? Okay. So that I can be equally, as I, as I can, uh, so can I, uh, so can I uh, join the team? And I, otherwise I will say I was not 
fairly treated because for you know, I did not get this one second or two seconds some advantage. So I would like we should not allow this kind of plan to be uh, applied to this whole, whole city, but uh, we should have more focused on how, what action we should I mean, take uh, from city side, for example, allocate the resource to help those disadvantaged or socially or economically disadvantaged students from pre-K, from uh, elementary school. Elementary Excuse me, Mr. G, can you wrap up your testimony, please? Your time is okay. up. Can you wrap sure. up? Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. I actually, you know, I really um, would like they all are fairly uh, treated. And, but for this exam school, I more hope we take action from pre-K, from elementary school, from grade one, two, instead of give them some points when they move to the Thank exam you. school. So I Thank would you. like to ask for reject this plan, but really think about the action. And yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Rachel Polliner. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Rachel Polliner, a grandparent of two BPS elementary students, an educator who consults with a wide range of schools and an organizer of progressive West Roxbury Roslindale. I live in West Roxbury. I'm sorry that I haven't testified prior as someone from West Roxbury who is very publicly in favor of the pandemic adjusted plan and in favor of long-term reform reform for equitable access and do today support the new proposal, though ask that it apply to 100% of the seats. The task force has done such thorough work studying the research, other cities plans, analyzing data and listening to residents. That's how we should operate. We shouldn't accept a last minute opaque add-on that sets aside 20% of the seats for citywide ranking which obviously advantages those who can pay for test prep or press for grade inflation. I understand that Chicago has such a set aside, which they adopted 10 years ago. I have to wonder if it would have been accepted now there. Uh, it should not be accepted now here. I know that no system is flawless. I have concerns about rankings, meaningless minute differences and its mental health and peer culture impacts. Even so, I support today's plan because competing with students with similar resources and socioeconomic tiers is more fair and will open access. Such a plan will move Boston forward, more so with 100% of the seats. I have followed a young cousin's experience in New York City where exam schools enroll only a tiny percentage of students and where she had a lot of good choices of other schools. Since Boston has such a huge percentage of students in exam schools, we are hoarding opportunity, investment, pride, and aspirations in them and disinvest in the rest. I believe distributing access to the exam schools will distribute pressure and support to other schools. This conversation is important for the whole district, even though there are growing pains. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Thomas Hayes. Good evening. My name is Tommy Hayes. My wife Leela and I have two children going into grades three and six at the Haley Pilot School. They have been in BPS since K-1. I'm also a BPS teacher entering my 15th year of teaching high school. The first 11 years at Charlestown High School and the last three years at English High School. Go Eagles. We live in Jamaica Plain and would like to voice our support for the task force's original proposal of 100% of exam school admissions to be distributed by rank within socioeconomic status tiers. Do we want to maintain the current racist system? 
or take this opportunity to make some carefully thought through changes that attempt to support equity in BPS. As our daughter is entering sixth grade and beginning to witness the exodus of her classmates to private and exam schools, as she learns about the changes ahead of her, she can see the inequity. It's not hidden from her. It looks like a crazy and unjust system to her. It's glaring how left behind so many students, mainly black and brown students, feel in the Haley middle, middle School who do not make it into exam schools or who aren't supported to learn how to make the system work for them. She also understands the unfairness of the way this decision will potentially be made here. Our kids are watching us. Our family wants more equity in the exam school process, even if it may disadvantage our family. Our priority is the long-term goal of racial and social, socioeconomic equity in our city. Additionally, what we really want is for the regular BPS high schools to have the resources they need to be seen in the eyes of the wider BPS community as good schools. That's what would truly support equity in this city. In the meantime, please keep the task force's recommendation to assign 100% of the seats by rank within um, socioeconomic status tiers. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next speaker is Ling Sheng Dong, John Zhang, Pamela Brooks, and Yvonne Powell. Please raise your hand. Ling, Ling Sheng. Hello. Yes, hello. Can you hear me, see me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, my name is Ling Chun Dong. Let me find my script. Uh, my name is Ling Chun Dong. I have, I'm a parent of two BBS students. I strongly disagree with the task force recommendations. Uh, here are the two reasons. The, the first one, last year, the same task force recommended to cancel the exam and, um, and said it was it's a temporary one-year policy change due to the COVID. And now the COVID is going away. We should restart the policy to allow exam for exam school admission. The second reason, the 10 point, uh, 15 point bonus policy make no sense. Do you, how do you choose the numbers? I think it's just random numbers. You do, you do simulation, then choose the number. It's, the, this number just mislead the students with random points without their hard working to earn them. It's very simple. If you train a dog to fetch, you should only give a dog a treat when he or she catches the ball, please. I have two recommendations. First, restart the exam school admission policy to the pre before COVID-19 one. The second, since the three current exam schools are very popular, I suggest to set up another three exam schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is John Zhang. I don't see anyone with that name. John Zhang. Uh, Pamela Brooks. Yvonne Powell. And Feng, Yvonne Powell, uh, Fen Ping Li. Fen Ping Li. Thank you. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks very much. 
Good evening, everyone. I'm Feng Ping Li. I live in Brighton, and I'm a mother of two kids who are in Boston Public Schools. And thanks school community members for giving me this time to raise my concern. First of all, I strongly oppose the 100% policy and the exam school selection policy proposed on June 30th. First of all, the policy is too complicated. It divides the city into several sub areas based on census tract. It includes 30% exam scores and 70% GPA. Further, it splits the seats to 20% and 80%. In addition, there are 10% to 15% bonus points to certain social economic groups. It's way too complicated. And second of all, the whole admission policy reminds me of the Cultural Revolution that happened in China many years ago. At the time, people within the country were divided to several sub to several categories based on their family's so-called social economic status. Some kids were denied educational opportunities, no matter how good they were, just because of their parents were a little wealthier than others in the name of equity. These kids were labeled as such, not because of their own characters or deeds, but because of their parents' social economic status. Now we all know the notorious Chinese cultural revolution is the darkest time in so many Chinese memories. I believe America, specifically Boston, is much better than that. Don't label kids based on who their parents are and where they live. Treat them as individual, independent individuals and teach them well that Hard working is worthy of effort, and easy bread is not e is will not last long. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next speaker are Sharon Sharon Kun, Karen Maziard, Virginia Berman, and Katya Bettina. Please raise your hand. Please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Hi, sorry about that. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, my name is Sharon Coons. My kids are going into K2 in second grade and I live in Roslindale. I'm here to voice my support for the exam school task force's recommendations as they stood before political pressure was exerted to set 20% of seats aside. Seats that will most likely go to kids with the most privilege. And that seems to have been put in motion by a counselor who represents a section of the city that already has the greatest economic and racial privilege. I'm frankly so disheartened by the mechanisms that seem to be in place in the city to preserve and compound systemic racism. I'm not from Boston, so I'm learning all of this fresh. I'm not saying other cities are perfect, far from it, but beyond our primary responsibility to the students of Boston, I think that we should recognize that the world is watching and history will judge how we respond in this moment. I believe in the promise of public schools and I believe in the promise of Boston public schools, but I don't want to be complicit in a system that, to poorly paraphrase Superintendent Casillas, and I apologize for that, that too often gives the least to those who enter with the least. I listened in on uh, several of the task force committee's sessions and also offered testimony there. And I don't necessarily agree with the recommendations. People on this call have pointed out some really valid concerns, including the potential impact on gentrification, et cetera, et cetera. There are ways in which people with the most privilege may try to game the system kind of like they do now. But that doesn't mean that we should stick with the status quo, which demonstrably produces a racist outcome. 20 seconds. I want to voice my strong support 
for the call for a school system where all schools have the opportunities and resources that Latin does. To paraphrase an earlier speaker, less opportunity hoarding we allow, the more opportunity there is to come together to fight for a top quality education for all of our students. And that's where our focus needs to be. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Karen Matiars. Good evening. My name is Karen Maziars. Until recently, I lived in Jamaica Plain for over 20 years. Both of my children attended the Orenberger Elementary School in West Roxbury. I am a BPS teacher, a BLS alumna, and a parent of a BLS alumna. I was, very, I was a very vocal advocate of Black at BLS over five years ago, and it pains me to see what little progress has been made since then in regards to equity and diversity at my alma mater. I definitely sympathize with the task force members that have dedicated countless hours to finding an equitable alternative to a racially biased test that has blocked so many deserving students from receiving a top-notch education that I had the privilege of receiving. Why did I have that privilege? Could it be that I grew up in West Roxbury? Went to a Catholic elementary school, was tutored by Pat Bench over 30 years ago. I can't tell you how much that haunts me to this very day. I'm here tonight to use my privilege and my voice to speak for the hundreds of students and their families that have come through my classroom over the years to say enough is enough. It's time to level the playing field. Into the dark powers that be behind the curtain, how dare you play politics with our children's lives? We elected you. We are the reason you are in office and not just your white constituents, the privileged, the ones that with the deep pockets, all of us. Speaking as a privileged white girl from West Roxbury, a woman that teaches in West Roxbury at a school that is exceptional, which most of the 20% of the privileged families turn their nose up at, I am here to state unequivocally that going forward with the 80-20 plan will continue to perpetuate the inequalities that have been plaguing this district for decades, long before the McLaughlin case in 97. I was a baby during the busing era but it still hangs like a noose around this city. And while we're at it, let's talk about the rigor that so many are clutching their pearls about. Give me a break. If you think for one second, the educators at BLS will lower their standards, it's just laughable. I was a student at BLS when Mr. Conanpasa said, look to your left, look to your right. One of them won't be there when you graduate. Every single child in this city deserves the chance to be that student that has the opportunity to benefit from the exact same education I benefited from. I've always been proud to call myself a BLS alum. I am beyond sad and angry to say that pretty much since my daughter walked through those doors in 2012, I'm not anymore. In a city that was the birthplace of education in the city that I have devoted myself to educating the children of, we can and we must do better. I will never stop using my voice to speak out against the white privilege that continues to run the city, the city that I love. Thank you for your time and I implore you, I implore you to do what is right and what is just for the city. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Virginia Berman. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. 
Uh, my name is Virginia Berman from Roslindale. Thanks for giving us the time to talk. And I really like what Karen just said. And I'm grateful to have had my kids in DPS since therefore one is a BLS grad this year and the other one is a rising junior at BLS. Um, I'm co-chair of Boston Latin Schools Families for Equity and Diversity. Um, I just wanted to share how impressed I've been with the incredible collaboration, analysis, expertise, and thoughtful recommendations by the Boston um, Exam School Task Force. Um, I just want to thank them for the work and the research, highly skilled um, force. It was apparent that from all their work that students' ability is not the barrier to entering the exam schools. So I appreciated that they, they sought to reduce the structural barriers that prevent capable children from entering Boston exam schools. And they came up with a final recommendation that was clear to distribute 100% of the exam school seats by rank within socioeconomic status tiers. I don't know if you can hear me, it's starting to thunder here. Um, a, a rash last minute change was reinserted after the task force had discussed and agreed carefully to, to discard it. A 20% set aside undermines the task force cha charge and expertise and it serves a privileged few. So who has claimed to Boston's exam school seat? This set aside sustains the status quo upholding structural racism at a high cost to all of us. These last minute changes jeopardize valuable steps the school committee task force took to create an entrance, entrance policy that works for our whole city. Um, so which, which direction are we going to choose to maintain the structural racism that's in Boston in our exam schools or one that opens up the benefits to the exam schools, to all those who have been shut out. As a parent, a member of the BLS, Families for Equity, I'm eager for the Boston, Boston School Committee to lift the barriers that keep our capable kids out of exam schools. And with that, lifting the quality of all our schools and our city. Thanks for your work and for taking time. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Katia Depina. I don't see anyone with that name. Uh, Gina Kogan, which I don't see either. So we will go to Jackie, Jackie Delisi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you to the task force for their time and for their hard work in wrestling with this issue. I'm a resident of Roslindale. I'm a white parent of two children, a BLS class of 2020 grad and a rising BLA junior. I'm also a former middle school science teacher and currently an education researcher and a program evaluator. My daughter at age 11 decided that she wanted to go to BLA. She was not a great test taker. And when she took the ISEE in the fall of her sixth grade year, even though her grades were strong and she's a hard worker, she did not get into BLA. So to enable her to compete for ninth grade admission, I found a private tutor who provided weekly targeted test preparation. On her second try, she got into BLA and now she's on the honor roll and thriving. But if we looked at her test, sixth grade test scores, they would have told us that she was not a good fit for BLA. In fact, we know that test scores are a lousy predictor of intellect and future success. And if my daughter had not had the good fortune of parents who had resources and flexible work schedules, she would not have received extended and intensive test preparation. It's not surprising that standardized academic test scores are highly correlated with socioeconomic status because these tests arose from the eugenics movement that sought to classify people and maintain an, an inequitable social order. Now in 2021, we know a lot about race and hierarchies. We know about stereotype threat, microaggressions and implicit bias. These are ways that an inequitable system is perpetuated. The use of test scores for admissions to highly resourced schools and the undermining 
of the task force's original recommendation reflects what Isabel Wilkerson and others refer to as a caste system. We have to understand the historical and social context with which our policies occur. And when we begin to view policies through the lens of caste, we see the importance of challenging the status quo. So we need to ask ourselves, why is it that the most highly resourced school in the district is also the most sought after high school and the most white high school? I encourage you to ask yourself why any citywide set aside is necessary. And I urge you to support the original proposal of the task force that assigns 100% of seats rank through SES groups. I also encourage you to think about, these are just three high schools within Boston. And we need intellectually challenging and engaging experiences for every student, regardless of the high school they attend. This means focusing on building hands-on, authentic, project-based and innovative instruction and building teacher capacity through high quality professional development so that our classrooms will prepare students for the world beyond high school. I challenge you to not only ensure equitable assignment, by accepting the original recommendation, but think beyond admissions to only beyond these three schools to begin to dismantle racial and socio social hierarchies, focus on classrooms and instruction across the system. And once you do that, you'll begin to support the growth and potential for every BPS student. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Jiang Shi Fang, followed by Suleika Soto, Jennifer Roberts Keddy, and Jeffrey. George. Jiang Shi Shang. Jiang Shi Fang, sorry. Members of the school committee, my name is Yangtze Fang. I am a recent graduate of Boston Latin School, a student at Harvard University, and a resident of West Roxbury and formerly of Chinatown. First, I want to comment on the 20% citywide allocation. As a first generation low income immigrant, I am very discouraged by the fact that the majority of speakers in support of a 100% tier system have appeared to be white, upper middle class people, the very group that could and would game the proposed system by sending their children to disadvantaged schools. I will also point out that unlike the past admission cycle, the new 20% set aside ranking would already include the 10 or 15 points from the socioeconomic indicators. In other words, contrary to what other speakers are claiming, the 20% would actually be skewed heavily toward disadvantaged students because of those added points. This also means that students who benefit most from the set aside would be the disadvantaged students who happen to live in higher income census tracts. The same students who are being left behind by the fact that the task force thought that individual in level indicators of socioeconomic status would be too logistically difficult to implement. Therefore, I urge you to maintain the 20% allocation unless a new mechanism can be found to address the fact that some disadvantaged students do live in higher income census tracts. I also want to talk about the double priority that the proposal gives to students who are involved with DCF experiencing homelessness or, li or living in DHA housing. The proposal gives this group of students an additional 15 points instead of 10 points given to other disadvantaged students. And at the same time, these students would be placed in a separate geographic tier that receives top priority. I'm not certain why this double priority is necessary since either mechanism by itself would provide a student with a significant over advantage over their peers already. I also have no objection to giving this double priority to DCF involved in homeless students, but I'm concerned about what the policy would apply about BHA housing. Giving so much extra priority to BHA housing students suggests that all of their peers who do not live in DHA housing are significantly better off, but this is not the case. What about students who live in permanently affordable housing that is privately managed, such as community-based nonprofits? What about students whose families receive Section 8 vouchers, SNAP benefits, or mass health, all of which are, have strict income limits? Are these students so much better off than BHA students as to warrant receiving much less of an advantage? In Please think about this before making the decision, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Sule Suleika Soto. So good evening. My name is Suleika Soto. I am a BPS parent and a member of the Boston Education Justice Alliance and a South Bend resident. As part of your strategic plan, 
I want to remind BPS and this school committee of the commitment that was made to eliminate opportunity and achievement gaps, amplify all voices, expand opportunity, and cultivate and trust, among other things. Voting to implement the exam school's task force original recommendation would represent a historic step towards equitable access for all Boston students and ensuring the community can trust that BPS is truly committed to changing its racist policies that continually leave black and brown students behind. It is time for the school committee to finally start to walk it like you talk it. Voting to distribute 100% of seats by rank within social economic status tiers would really start to lead BPS in the right direction by becoming a district that we can all be proud of. One that does not pin school communities against each other nor suppresses community voice as some city councilors are attempting to do and in contradiction to your plan. If we keep it 100, each tier will consist of children living in similar socioeconomic circumstances. This means children from the lowest income families won't have to compete with children from the wealthiest families who often provide private tutoring and other advantages that have nothing to do with merit. This exam school task force was truly committed to their charge by ensuring their recommendation reflected the racial, socioeconomic, and geographic diversity of all students in Boston's K through 12 schools in the city of Boston. And it also expanded opportunities for the majority of BPS students. They engaged in a rigorous five month public process resulting in a proposal supported overwhelmingly by its members that would expand opportunity for all students. All the work and commitment they put into coming up with this original recommendation cannot be thrown away. The data shown was unequivocal that the 20% citywide set aside would give extra seats to the most privileged families, contradicting the task force charge. And in fact, this is why they rejected it. Last one, accepting the shadowy maneuvers to ensure those with privilege remain privileged is wrong. It would demonstrate that Boston and this school committee is still subject to the systems of an inequity that have barred a generation of black and Latinx students from fair access to, to exam schools and a high quality education overall. Unless you vote for the task force recommendation as agreed upon on Monday, June 28th, for 100% allocated by tiers of students with comparable socioeconomic status, ranked by grades and test scores, you will show you are not committed to the strategic plan that you outlined and are not trustworthy. We want to be able to trust you. This, use this opportunity to amplify the voice of the task force, cultivate the trust of the communities and stakeholders who dedicated their time to coming up with this recommendation and truly use this time to eliminate um, opportunity gaps that already exist in BPS. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Jennifer Roberts Petty. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. My name is Jennifer Roberts Ketty and I live in Roslindale. I am a BLS graduate of the class of 1994. I am a parent of a BPS fourth grader and I am an inclusion teacher at the Bates. It is perhaps this last position that has taught me the most about the district effort, district's efforts to practice equity and justice and the ways it too often falls short. BPS is currently in the process of increasing the number of its inclusion and bilingual classrooms. We claim to be an anti-racist district in word, if not yet always in deed. Yet racism, inequity, injustice, and exclusion persist throughout our middle school and high school enrollment process. And when the task force arrived at a recommendation that would infuse some amount of equity into the process, it was undermined in the 11th hour by city officials who seem to be beholden to the subset of their constituents who can both afford tutors to boost their kids' rankings and who have no problem upholding the status quo that favors the white and the wealthy. As it now stands when my son, who is white, completes fifth grade, where he will land in BPS will be uncertain at best. But with our privileges, I feel confident that he will be able to navigate any school assignment just fine. I do not feel that same confidence when the more vulnerable of my students leave our inclusion program only to enter into that uncertainty. Many of them are students with disabilities or English learners or both, or live in low-income households. 
most of them will not have a chance at the opportunities we are here to discuss unless inclusivity is truly embraced as a mindset district wide. We all lose out when any of our students are excluded from the opportunities that would allow them to grow and thrive, to pursue their passions, and discover for themselves how best to contribute to our community. For now, I ask that the school committee return to the task force's original consensus and adopt the version of their proposal that assigns 100% of invitations to selective schools using socioeconomic tiers. I also ask that you remember that this is just the beginning of moving our district toward equity and justice. Keep it 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Jeffrey George, followed by Jen DiMano. Je I don't see a Jeffrey George. So Jen DiMano. Please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. There you go. Can you hear me and see me both? Yes. Great. My name is Jen Damano, and I'm a 25 year resident of Charlestown. We have a rising 11th grader at the Boston Latin School. And I'm calling tonight in support of the final recommendation of the task force, the 80-20 um, recommendation, because it brings new components to the admissions process that will bring greater socioeconomic and geographic diversity to Boston's exam schools. I also support the allocation of this 20% of the seats citywide on the straight rank basis because it will increase the likelihood that the most talented children in the city will remain in Boston public schools. We know that thousands of Boston children choose to leave BPS each year to enroll in independent schools or medco programs or leave the city altogether. For these top students without a, a strong exam school option and the opportunity to earn that seat, our city will continue to lose more of its most talented children. I ask too that our school committee focus its efforts on improving our underperforming schools and providing all of the children of the city of Boston a robust world-class education. I appreciate your time and many thanks to the task force. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now have speakers requiring Cantonese interpretation. I will turn off the interpretation icon. Interpreters will be in the main channel. Interpreters, please stop interpreting and mute yourself for this part of the testimony. Okay. Um, and I will need Anna to. Um, this is Anna. 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 I just told her um, to raise her hand and and unmute and show her camera. Jenny. 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 Jenny, please unmute yourself. 
hello， 我喺度。hello Jenny， 阿 Jenny 你好，你慢慢讲，我你讲几句，我又讲几句吓。好，好 ，OK。我系大家好，你,你要开系啦，你系开嘅视频系啦。Thank you、oh.。Thank you。Please begin。大家好，我系昆士学校家长。根据你哋分区录取 exam school 嘅新政策，对我哋少数民族同未有双语文化背景嘅亚裔学生系好唔公平嘅。Hmm. So hi, my name is Jenny. I am a parent of JQUS.、Um, I want to say that your new exam school policy is actually it's very unfair for the immigrants, for the and then for the English learners. 公校完全忽视咗我哋呢班双语亚裔勤奋又有上进心嘅好学生，得唔到支持同埋鼓励。Mm -hmm. The Boston Public School totally neglect the student who work hard and、um, and try to achieve what they want. School is not just a place to add more classes for these students who have different cultural backgrounds and have advanced work-class students who have to have equal and fair education in order to enter the exam school. Exam school. I think the Boston Public School should help and compensate us for those who are、uh, from the immigration immigrant background and with the AWC、um, uh, background, and also、uh, to help the English learner to gain the seat at the exam school. 请不要剥削我哋呢班亚裔诶、呃、勤奋好学嘅好学生嘅学习机会。Do not take away our chance to enter the exam school. We work very hard. 咁样对成绩优异 advanced 嗰个学生咧，系好唔公平嘅。This is very unfair for those who who get really good grades and who work very hard. Exam school 嘅目的从来都系用考试嘅最高分数嘅五十 percent， 同埋嘅 GPA 嘅五十 percent 嚟挑选学生入嘅 exam school。The exam school in the past always used fifty percent of GPA and fifty percent of the exam. To、um, estimate to、um, for the admission、um, uh, policy, 系要考试通过透明、公开、公平嘅选拔赛。The exam itself is fair and is a competition, and it gives everybody a fair chance and with transparency, we believe. 同埋提高学生嘅入学标准。It is to enhance the admission quality of the students as well. 咁才系才是真正能够教育方针同埋嘅理念。This is how the real education policy and guidance、um, should be. Exam school 系个学生每个学生嘅最高嘅目标。A lot of the students really take a look at, like, really think of the exam school admission as the goal. Try to achieve. 我哋每个学生真系为呢个目标而争取。Every students work hard towards this goal. 依家你哋用嘅诶 zip code 变到啲学生冇咗个目标。Now you're using zip code. The students are lost and about the what goals they are、uh, working on. 个学生冇咗个目标，就冇咗个原动力去争取。Students, um, they don't have. So, so student lost to go, and they don't have, they they don't have the drive to work work hard to achieve the goal. 我哋希望你哋用考试嘅方式，最公平公正嘅录取学生为入 exam school. We hope that you really use the exam to evaluate the students and for their admission policy. 因为我哋呢啲新移民嚟到，啲仔女系用好勤奋、好努力去读书而得到最好嘅成绩。We as an immigrant, our kids work very, very hard to try to go to this exam school. Two minutes are up. 我哋一分钟到啦。大家有公平、公平嘅公正嘅学习机会，多谢大家。I hope that you will give us a fair chance for the education. Thank you. Thank you. 唔该晒你。Next speaker is Shirley Chen Wang. 下一个系 Shirley Chen Wang. Hello, Shirley. Hi, 听到听到。系你好，你好，你好。诶，继续嚟，好
，我几我系几句。啊！我系 Kush 学校嘅家长，我有三个细路仔。诶、so, ，最高最大嗰个已经喺诶拉丁学校啊、uh, 八年级。Okay, so um, I am a my name is Shelly. I am a parents. I have three kids. Um, the oldest one is actually eighth grade in the in the Boston Latin School. 因为我哋咧唔系好识英文咧，所以咧都期待细路仔可以从啊好细个度开始就开始，等佢哋有呢个目标啊，勤奋读书，争取去到拉丁 school 啦。You know, you know, as immigrant, our English is not great, so we really hope that our kids will have a chance to go to the best school that will be the exam school to get the best education. 所以我哋觉得优质系拉丁学校嘅最最高嘅梦想咯。So, so that's why we think the vigor education is the highest goal for our kids to to, to achieve in terms of education. So, we don't think that every ethnic or now which ethnic group those people will be more, so we think it's not fair. Actually, it's not. So, we don't really think of what race the compositions of the school will 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 be considered fair and unfair. We don't think of it that way. 今日我哋聽到好多將貧窮作為係一個不公平嘅制度，我覺得係好唔啱嘅咯。So today we hear a lot of um a lot of people talk about as using poverty as an indicator to to achieve um uh to be fair in the system。你話邊個人一出世就係世界首富啦？係要自己勤奮先去改變到自己嘅命運。所以我哋喺來自中國，我哋個個。父母都嚇做嗰啲低收入工，但係個個都做幾份工，個個都努力籌錢俾啲仔女去讀書嘅。So let's say, do you think the people just born and then become the richest person in the world? Never. People have to work hard and achieve what they want. So we came from China as immigrant. We work very, very hard and try to provide the best chance opportunity for our kids. Um. So. Okay. 我哋覺得。好似中國誒美國政府已經係把啲人照顧得好好，我哋唔覺得將為貧窮作為一個啊喺三間學校收生嘅一個定律。我希望將呢個其實講話歧視嘅就係一個藉口嚟嘅。We we actually think the American government take, try to take good care of people and using poverty as an emission gain. We we think it's unfair and it's not. It shouldn't be that way. 都唔好忘記，我哋係同世界去比較，我哋係去優質嘅學校，拉丁係一個優質嘅學校，所以係有能力嘅學生先去到優質嘅學校。I just want to remind everyone that the Boston, the exam school in Boston, we are comparing to the best schools in the world. So only should take the best student、um, to the school. 所以我覺得可以提供其他公校嘅資源，可以 excellent for all 咁樣去將拉丁嘅教學水平擴展去其他高中，咁樣大家可以一齊進步。但係唔係將拉丁嘅水平提降低咗？嗯、mm, ，I actually believe we should expand like program like excellent for all for all other、um, district in this in the school, but there's not sacrificing the vigor.、Um, Admission policy, and then the the admission for the exam school to equalize、uh, the system. What? Okay. Uh, 最后一句就系我哋诶移民都可以做到呢个摆脱贫穷。点解本地人唔可以摆脱贫贫穷嘅命运咧 ？So the the last thing I want to say, as immigrant, we work really hard try to get our property. So everybody should be able to do that. 多謝大家。Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. 多謝你。Next speaker is Yan Chan Lu. I don't speak. I don't. Yan Chan Lu， 你係咪喺度啊？你喺度開麥舉手，開視頻，等我哋知道。Yeah, I don't see the name. And Ivan Lee. Ivan Lee， 到你啦。你喺咩度啊 ？I don't see that name either. Okay. Jolie. Chen, Jolie Chen, 到你。举手开麦，开视频。Kelly Wang, Kelly Wang， 到你啦。Kelly Wang, Kelly Wang， 举手开麦，开视频。如果你喺度嘅话。Oh. 
I think I see someone with them. I think. No, I can't. No, sorry. Um, William Wong. William Wong, you here? Ma, do you find it? William Wong, raise your hand. Can you start the video? Please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Please raise your hand. Can you start the video? If you are here, please unmute yourself. William Wong, please turn on your camera and unmute yourself. William Wong, you raise your hand. If you are here, please unmute yourself. Hello. 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 我希望今次呢個方案咧，能夠達成一個目的，就係公平公正。I hope that the outcome of this recommendation will be fair and to serve justice。係啦，因為如果呢個方案達唔到公平公正咧，整個社會就形成一種風氣，就係可以唔公平，可以唔公正。So at the end, if this decision would, would it this 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 decision will simplify. If this decision will at the end to be unjust, it will send a really bad example to tell the world we don't have to do things in a just and a fair way. Because in our first immigrant coming, actually, we have received very little help. When we first moved, uh, migrated, immigrated to the U.S., we get very little help. My daughter used a month of time to read 45 books to raise her English. My daughter read 45 books in the summer to try to improve her English level. Yeah, because we know the American dream is a you put in effort. Because we know in America, to achieve your American dream is to work hard, then you can achieve your dream. But now this solution is a bowling alley solution. But this policy it seems to be awarding the people who doesn't work hard, lazy people, and punishing the people who work hard. Yeah, it's like in Olympic game 嘅一百米赛跑入边，有啲人系需要跑一百米，而有啲人因为佢嘅唔同嘅原因，佢只系需要跑八十米，唔通咁就系公平咩 ？So I'll give you an analogy. Let's say in Olympic games, let's say you were in the Olympic games. For those have to run a hundred miles, that's the game. But some other people, they only have to run eighty-eight miles. Is that fair? 所以其實要改變嘅唔係而家呢個 exam school 誒、呃、呢、这個制度，而係要改變一啲點樣提高嗰啲所謂嘅低收入羣體或者某啲族裔嘅，提高佢哋嘅資源，俾多啲 program 佢哋，俾多啲支持佢哋。So to look at the big Bigger picture, it's not to change exam school policy, but to lift up those who is in poverty to help them um, in in the in a real way they take in benefit. 系啦，嗯、um, ，其实如果认为 exam school 呢种方式系咁多人都认可，觉得好嘅，其实可以开多几间呢种诶、uh, exam school， 提高呢方面嘅资源。If you think exam school is so wonderful, why do, why can we have more exam school to expand the opportunity for more people to get into this school? Twenty seconds left. Is that me?
。OK， 所以我再讲一样嘢就系、是，唔所有人都系平等嘅，无论佢出身系贫穷富贵或者出生乜嘢种族，但系所有人应该系喺一个公平公正嘅规则下边。I want to say that the last thing I want to say is, we disregard where people came from, the race, the poverty. We should we should treat them as equal. Four minutes. Sir. 好，多谢。Thank you so much. 多谢你发言。Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you.、Uh, um, I will now activate the interpretation icon, and all the interpreters will be sent to your channels, and you can start interpreting again. Madam Chair, that concludes our speakers for public comment. You're you're on mute. Thank you, Ms. Parvex. As we prepare to close this evening, I want to thank everyone who spoke and shared your unique perspectives. Your testimony is very important to us. The school committee will vote on the final exam schools admissions policies next Wednesday, July fourteenth at five p.m. If there's nothing third. Further, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn this listening session. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you.、Um, is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion?、Uh, there's no objection, Madam Chair. I would just I really like to thank everyone for the very, very thoughtful comments tonight.、Um, this was really, really helpful. Extraordinarily thoughtful.、Um, Comments, and I deeply appreciated it. Yes, thank you. I agree with you absolutely. Thank you.、Great. So, so there was no objection to the motion. So, Ms. Parvitz, will you please call the roll? Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Coleman. Mr. Deraujo. Yes. Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Ms. Robinson. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. This listening session is adjourned. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you Thanks.